Welcome to Gospel Commission. I hope you're blessed in the Lord today. In this video, we want to continue to talk about perseverance of the saints, and I want to point out what I believe is the most dangerous and unbiblical aspect of that doctrine. Now, in the last video, we noted that this doctrine did not begin until the 16th century. The whole idea of eternal security, namely that somebody that's already believed in Jesus Christ could never go to hell after they've already believed that they are uh, eternally secure in their salvation. This idea did not begin until the 1500s with John Calvin. Augustine did not believe this in the 5th century, and even Luther in the 16th century did not believe this. This is a unique doctrine to John Calvin, and of course it adapted later with the dispensationalists that they took away the necessity to even live holy and said that even if you live in sin, even if you, uh, even if you n stop believing, you're Salvation is eternally secure after you've once believed in Jesus. So they would call it once saved, always saved. But this doctrine of eternal security, especially this doctrine of perseverance of the saints, started in the 16th century. That is a new and novel idea. It is not orthodox, and we don't have to consider it. We don't have to consider every doctrine that comes up and say, well, they've got some Bible verses that sound like it's saying that, so we need to honestly consider it and be open-minded. No, we don't need to be open-minded to such novel teachings. That's what orthodoxy is about. If we go back to the beginning of the church and they knew nothing of this, and then we even come to men that twisted scripture and twisted and brought in different philosophies like Augustine, and even they didn't buy such a doctrine, then why would we even consider believing it. It's like us as, as, as Christians being offered and told us, you know, hey, Joseph Smith might be a prophet. Maybe you should look into it. You need to be more open-minded about it. No, we don't need to be open-minded about any such thing. And so we don't need to be open-minded about this idea of eternal security. It's a new doctrine. You might say, well, but we've always held to this. Who is we? If you're talking about dispensationalists over the last couple hundred years, yes. If you're talking about uh, those that are in the Reformed camp, particularly the Calvinist camp for over the last 500 years, yes. But if you go back before that, it's a new doctrine. It's not true. It's brand new. So please don't consider every doctrine as being worthy of your attention. This one is not so. But here I want to go ahead and jump into the scripture and let's look here at uh, Genesis chapter 2. Starting in verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. So God gives him a strong warning here. He says, if you do what I command you not to do, you will die. Now, was this a sincere warning? Was this something that could really happen to Adam, that if he really ate, that he would truly die? Or, um, or was God going to make sure that he never ate? Uh, how is this going to work out? Of course, we know the story, so we know exactly what happened. But the other fact is that we know the character of God, and we know that God is not duplicitous, that if he warns about something, that it is a sincere warning. There is real danger involved what he warns, with what he warns about. We need to take God at his word. Let his yes be yes and his no be no because God is not a liar and he is not duplicitous. And he is not like the, the serpent we see here in, in Genesis 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field the Lord God had made. And this is really the issue. When people believe in the idea of perseverance of the saints and they believe that all the warning passages are in the scripture but they're hypothetical because they can there's really no danger for a believer because God will make sure that they endure to the end then there's a subtle philosophy in that there's a subtlety to that and that's not the way God is God is very plain he wrote the scriptures for disciples and for simple minded men. He didn't write it for scholars that can take all philosophical ideas and, and twist around every verse of scripture. No, he wrote it simply. His yes is yes and his no is no. He's not like this subtle serpent. He is direct and he is a God of truth. And so here it says in verse one, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God said, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And, uh, of the garden? and the woman said, we may eat of the fruit from the trees of the garden, but from the fruit, fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you will not eat of it, nor will you touch it, nor will you touch it, or else you will die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die, for God knows that on the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Did God really say? 
Did God really warn believers that if they turn back to rebellion and walk according to the flesh, that they will perish ultimately, that they will not inherit the kingdom of God, that they will suffer the wrath of God and be sons of disobedience and suffer the wrath that the sons of disobedience suffer? Did God really say that? Yes, indeed, he did. Now, is he subtly saying, yes, you could, but I'll never let it happen? No, God is not subtle like the serpent. So in this video, I just want to go, let's go to the passages of Scripture. Let's go and just run through some basic doctrines of Scripture, some basic teachings. They're plain teachings, just as the one that was given to Adam in the garden is a plain teaching. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 13. This is, all of these are written to believers and they're warnings to believers. Here's what it says. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if through the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if Indeed, we suffer with him that we also may be glorified with him. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the power of the Holy Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. If you suffer and endure with Christ, you will be glorified with him. But if not, you will be condemned in your sin. This is a warning of scripture. God is not duplicitous. He is not being hypothetical. He is giving a sincere warning just as he did in the Garden of Eden. Let's flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. My friend, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. This is a warning that if you live in these things, you will die. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived, my friend. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are revealed, which are these, adultery, sexual immorality, impurity, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, rage, selfishness, dissension, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. I warn you, as I previously, previously warned you, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not live according to the flesh, or you will not inherit the kingdom of God. If we jump over to chapter 6, verse 7, do not be deceived. Here we have it again. Do not be deceived. Don't let subtlety of philosophy rob you of the truth of God. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever, you, whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But to the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. If you put by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. But if you live according to the flesh, you will die. You will suffer corruption and you will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is very clear from the Scripture. Let's go to another. Ephesians chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse, starting in verse 3. Do not... And do, not let sexually, and do not let sexual immorality or any impurity or greed be named among you, as these are not proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse joking, which are not fitting. Instead, give thanks. For this you know, that no sexually immoral person or impure person or one who is greedy, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. No one who lives in sexual immorality, has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. My friend, the scriptures are very clear. God's word is not yes and yes, or yes and no at the same time. His yes is yes, and his no is no. His warnings are real. There is sincere and real danger. When he gives us that warnings, it's so that we will not walk in it. Now, some will say, yes, but Calvinists believe this. Yes, they do. 
They believe that there is a danger that those that live according to the flesh will die and will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is more than those that hold to easy believism, the later form of perseverance of the saints, the watered down form that says that even if you believe, then after that, no matter what you do, you will still inherit the kingdom of God because sanctification and justification have no relation with one another. So it's true that the Calvinist does believe that these scriptures must be followed. I'm not accusing them of saying anything else, but they also believe that these are hypothetical. In what way would they say that they're hypothetical? Maybe they don't like that word hypothetical. Hypothetical means that God's telling them this, but it can actually never happen to them. It's hypothetical. It can't really happen. But the word of God is clear. He gives the warning. My friend, if I am a father of a child and I give him a warning, it's a sincere and honest and loving warning and there is real danger in it. Otherwise, I wouldn't give the warning. It's not a philosophical gymnastics game where I say, don't do it. And since I said, don't do it, you can't do it. And I'll make sure that you don't do it. Whenever somebody gets into that mindset, what it does is it doles our sense of the fear, a godly fear of God. Because a person is going to think like this. Well, I'm a Christian, and this is a hypothetical warning that's supposed to keep me on the right track, but God will certainly do it. God will do my part by making me do my part. He will cause me to do it. He will influence me in such a way that I cannot not do what he gives as a warning here. That's a dangerous thought because the scripture tells us that we are supposed to guard our own hearts and that we are responsible for our own decisions, that we are going to be judged according to what we have decided on the last day. According to our deeds, we will be judged. And so, my friend, this doles the sense of godly fear, and we cannot let that do. Now, you say, no, it doesn't dole the sense of godly fear. It does. It does indeed. Whether you know it or not, if you are a Calvinist, then your sense of godly fear, you have two choices. Either you believe the doctrine of perseverance and that brings you comfort. If that brings you comfort, then it is a false comfort because it's an idea that you yourself cannot fall away. You can't fall away. That's what the doctrine of perseverance, if you believe it and you apply it to yourself, it's going to bring you a comfort that you cannot fall away. Therefore, your idea, your sense of fear is dulled because it cannot happen to you. But if you say, no, no, no. It only applies to me as long as I'm walking in these things. Okay, then, then the doctrine of perseverance brings you no security. Only the word of God brings you security. I hope you will walk in that way. I hope you'll forget all about the doctrine of perseverance. Instead, just come to these scriptures that warn you to stay away from it, and then you will cry out to God daily that you will walk out your salvation with fear and trembling, and that you will trust him to guard you and to keep you, that you will trust him that he is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but he will always provide a way of escape so that you can, fall, you can stand up under it. And that when you do fall, that you have the throne of grace, that you can come to him as an advocate that's seated at the right hand of God for you, and you can come and receive mercy to, and forgiveness of your sin, but you can also receive ga- grace to overcome in your sin. That's how we deal with the scripture. We realize that God does promise us and, and help us to stand, but we also have a role to play. And so that's why we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, because we know there are serious consequences if we do not. We don't take in this foreign doctrine, this novel doctrine, this unorthodox idea that somehow I can apply this comforting idea to myself that I can never ultimately be lost. Yes, each one of us can be ultimately lost. And if you're a Calvinist, you agree with that. You agree that, yes, we could ultimately be lost. We could be deceived. We could be false converts. We could be uh, deceiving ourselves. And so then why are you even talking about perseverance of the saints? It makes no difference. Just go to the simple scripture. God warns us. God gives us promises that he will strengthen us and he gives us responsibility that we must take the way of escape and if we fall, that we must come to the throne of grace and we, that we might receive mercy and help in time of need. My friend, God is not duplicitous. He gives sincere, real warnings because there is a real, sincere danger. Let us fear God and walk with him, clinging closely to him, knowing that if we walk away from him, we walk away from eternal life. But if we cling to him, then we will have eternal life through him. I hope this helps you. God bless.